Well, again, welcome everybody to Open Arms Community Church. We are excited that you're here today and trust that God's going to meet and bless you in a wonderful way as we uh, launch this new series called It's Not Fair. Uh, we are going to be walking through the Easter story to help us grab hold of some realities and some truths about the unfairness of life. How many know life is not fair? Yes, and if you don't know that yet, I'm not sure what bubble you've been living in, but God, uh, you know, has created a world full of free will, uh, a world where dynamics are in play that oftentimes are, are uh, beyond our control, where people's choices influence and affect directly each of our lives. And, you know, when we look at the world, life isn't fair, is it? Good things happen to bad people. Have you noticed? And bad things happen to good people. We see young people dying of sickness and accidents. We see others laying their lives down to, to secure rights and privileges for people that oftentimes will be uh, at best negligent or, or careless with those rights or privileges, and others will outright abuse them. Isn't that right? We will have spouses cheat. We will have children's lives ripped apart as mom and dad choose to divorce. Right? Think about this. We have families impacted because other people choose to, to chase after the next tie. And whether it's through gambling, whether it's through food, whether it's through sexual habits, or whether it is through uh, substance abuse, the reality is, is these choices impact and bring crisis to family and friends. Life isn't fair. And when it comes to unfairness, friends, many times we don't just find it amongst those uh, that are far off from us, coworkers and, and, and acquaintances, but oftentimes the unfairness is very near and dear to our hearts. It's family and friends who, who hurt us, family and friends who disappoint and let us down. They will even abandon us, won't they? Sure. They'll abandon they will betray. And we've all felt this in one way or another. When I was in the fifth grade, I was a, a walker, which meant that I walked home from the elementary school. And, uh, and I had some neighborhood friends that I would regularly hang out with and play with. And one of them, his name was Jason. I actually had about three or four friends whose name was Jason in my younger years. And, um, and Jason and I were walking home from school this one day. And we weren't too far away from the school, and all of the sudden, my friend throws me into a full Nelson, picks me up off the ground. He was bigger and older and bigger than I was. Next thing I know, I'm suspended in the air with my arms above my head, my school books fall to the ground, and out from behind this tree comes another bully, whose name was Jerry, and he proceeds to start to punch me and beat me up. And I'm there, I'm helpless. I'm struggling and I'm, I mean, questions are racing through my mind. What, what, the, what did I do? First of all, to gain the attention of this bully Jerry who was older, bigger than me, different grade. Why was he, why was he doing this? And I struggled even more so with the reality that my friend had just betrayed me and was participating in me getting beat up. I wondered where any of my friends were. I struggled not only with, with the physical pain of getting beat, but I felt emotional pain of being abandoned and betrayed by my friends. How many know life lets us down? Life isn't fair. And if there was anyone acquainted with unfairness, if there was anyone who was the epitome 
of the unfairness of life, it was Jesus Christ. My story, a young, innocent fifth grader getting beat up, is sad. But it doesn't compare to the fact that Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, chose for himself as God. Where would he be born? When would he be born? To what family? In what place? What time? And he chose pain. He chose a path that was very, very different than what we might expect. And over these next several weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at the Easter story in particular, the last week, the last few days in reality of Jesus's existence here on earth. And we're going to learn some very practical and very relevant and very profound truths about the unfairness of life. As we do this The question might be, what is it about this Jesus guy that keeps bringing us back to him? Why is he the epitome of the unfairness of life? Why is he the answer again and again and again to whatever we're facing, whatever we're going through, whatever difficulty, crisis, challenge, pain, and even joys and successes? Why is Jesus the anchor? Why is he that pillar, that standard that we constantly run back to, measure and compare all things to? Finding strength, stability, and an orientation to what is right in every circumstance. I like what historian H.G. Wells had to say. He made this comment. He said, more than 1,900 years later, A historian like myself, who does not even call himself a Christian, so H.G. Wells, what he's about to say, he is not saying it as one who believes in and follows Jesus. He is saying this as one who does not. He says, 1,900 years later, a historian like myself, who doesn't even call himself a a Christian, finds the picture of history centering irresistibly around the life and character of this most significant man. The historian's test of an individual's greatness is, what did he leave to grow? Did he start men to thinking along fresh lines with a vigor that persisted long after him? By this test... Jesus stands first. There is no one else who has impacted the world and history like Jesus Christ. What is it that makes this man so significant, to quote H.G. Wells? Why do we keep coming back to him? Because he and he alone fulfills the full description of God in the flesh and redeemer of humanity, savior of the world. He and he alone lives up to the measuring stick of what that means. Ironically, when we talk about the unfairness of life, just a few months ago, if you'll remember, we were celebrating the birth of this most significant man. And we learned during that season here at Open Arms some of the unfairness that Jesus went through. You know, he wasn't born into pomp and luxury and and comforts. He was born into obscurity and poverty. And instead of a uh, a nice, comfortable house with a crib and cra- or cradle to be born into. He was born in a barn. Instead of being surrounded by loved ones, he was surrounded by animals. Right? Instead of growing up in a nice town or a nice part of town, he grew up in Nazareth, which was a town that was known as being a bad place, that nothing good can come from there. 
instead of growing up in his country as a fellow countryman, he had to flee and live as a refugee for years in another country, living as a foreigner, only to come back and instead of being able to live a normal life, he had to live hidden because the authorities were out to find this child and kill him? Instead of the easy life of growing up in, in comforts and, and having lots of money, he grew up in a very working class family where they had to labor to make ends meet. And of course... The irony is, is that as he grew up, instead of being the king of kings and lord of lords upon this earth where he could say, do this for me and, and serve me and make, the, you know, uh, everybody bring to me your gifts, he gave and he served. And ironically, in spite of this tremendously good life that impacted history, setting this model example of what love and truth look like in human form, he was betrayed, tortured, and killed as a criminal. You want to talk about being acquainted with the unfairness of life? Jesus chose the underdog. He chose the unfair path. And I want to draw your attention to your outlines Because at the time of Jesus' greatest need, as we enter into this Easter season, I want to bring you up to speed. Jesus has done three and a half years of earthly ministry. And at the beginning of that earthly ministry, three years ago, he was, three, three and a half years ago, he had chosen 12 men to be his closest companions, his friends, his co-workers in this ministry. Those 12 men followed him and went everywhere he went. They saw everything that he did. They heard everything that he taught. They saw him do the miraculous. And not only did they see him do it, but he, when he delegated that authority and power to them, they themselves went around and participated in the miraculous. They cast down demons from people. They healed sick people. They were a part of the multiplication of bread. A few loaves of bread and fish were multiplied in their hands to feed thousands of men, women, and children. They saw it. They participated in it. They felt it. And yet, friends, in spite of everything Jesus did, here's the reality that Jesus lived in. In your outlines, not only did Jesus' own family not believe or support him, but his closest disciples betrayed and abandoned him. You see, in this final week, which we've not yet come to, we will in a few weeks. Jesus went from having the masses praise him and declare him the son of David, the coming Messiah, the king, and calling upon him to deliver them from oppression, hailing him, praising him, to yelling, crucify. And where were his friends? Where were his friends? In Matthew chapter 26, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, we know he had a meal with his closest followers, all 12 of them and a few others. And then after that meal, during the meal, one of his disciples left. His name was Judas. Jesus takes the others with him, and they leave the upper room where they were dining, and they go out to the Mount of Olives, a garden there known as Gethsemane. And in that garden, he asked them to pray with him because he knew his hour had come. And in Matthew 26, 
toward the end of his praying, a crowd of soldiers come into the garden, led by Judas. And it says in verse 14, then one of the 12, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and he asked, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? So we're rewinding just a little bit. Before this event happened, the wheels were already turning. The players were already set in motion. And Judas, who was Jesus' friend, is betraying him. He goes to the high priest and says, listen, what will you give me? And notice they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. How many know? You don't need enemies when you have that kind of friend. Have we ever been in that place where people we cared about, people that we thought were our friends or even our family, right? People who supposedly loved us were really out to get us. They were watching for opportunities to find fault. They were watching for opportunities to, to give us a hard time for things or, or to undermine our, our relationship with someone, our friendship with someone, or our reputation. Have you ever been there? And here is Judas selling off his friend. What is the life of Jesus worth? 30 pieces of silver. What's the li- what is uh, your friendship worth? What is your marriage worth? What is your, your uh, co-worker relationship or your employment relationship worth? From that time on, Judas is watching. Well, he knows Jesus is method of operation. He knows his patterns. And so after they had that meal, he knew where Jesus would go and pray. He knew where they would be. And so during the meal, Judas slips off and he goes to the high priest and says, I know where he's going to be. So he's at the temple talking with the high priest, and they're gathering the soldiers. Jesus leaves the upper room and goes to the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. And while he's praying, Judas leads them. And we know the story that while Jesus is praying, the other disciples keep falling asleep on him, right? So where's the support network there, right? I thought you were my friends. I thought you could pray with me. I thought you'd be here for me. I'm in deep distress to the point that while he's praying, he literally sweats drops of blood. That's stress. That's concern about what is about to come upon him. And if you and I understood the fullness and the weightiness of what Jesus was about to go through, it wasn't just the physical torture that was going to be the most distressing, although that alone kills a man. But it was the fact that the punishment of every sin of all humanity, of all history, from beginning of creation to the end of the earth, past, present, and future, was about to be laid upon him. The very wrath of God was about to be laid upon him. Friends, it's huge. So here he is, finally, towards the end of his moment in that garden, and he goes to his followers and says, You know, can't you just stay up with me one hour and pray? And then verse 47 says, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kissed is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. How many would take Jesus aside at this moment and yell out, it's not fair? It's not fair that his, one of his closest friends was, was sneaking around behind his back and setting him up to get beat up. It's not fair that those who are closest to him 
are about to completely abandon him. Not only does Judas betray him, friends, Judas, who spent years with him, Judas, who watched all the miracles, Judas, who heard all the teachings, Judas, who participated in some of those miracles and doing the works of God. And, and what did Jesus do to Judas? All he did is bless him, serve him, show kindness and favor to him. What is it that Jesus did to deserve Judas's betrayal? And after all of this, he betrays him with a kiss, right? A sign of friendship. Love you, brother. Bam. The hammer falls. Look what happens. Verse 55. In that hour, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion? that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching, and you did not arrest me, but this has all taken place to fulfill the writings of the prophets so that they might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. They seized Jesus, arrest him, take him to falsely accuse him, ultimately torture him, and have him crucified. We know the story, right? Fast forward. But I want you to see in this moment that here's Jesus confronting the unfairness, saying, why are you here? We know why they're here. It's not an issue of justice. It's conspiracy. He does not, you know, as a human perspective, they're there really is no reason, there's no rationale for why Judas would be doing this. Does he think it'll pressure Jesus into to stepping up his game and calling everyone to arms to overthrow the Roman oppression? Maybe. Is this his way of somehow getting back at Jesus, having him arrested and, and for, for times that maybe he felt slighted by Jesus or felt like Jesus was not including him? Or was he just greedy and wanted money? We don't really know the mind of Jesus. We know that the Bible says he became possessed by the devil. We know that he became so distraught for whatever reason, after the arrest and the conviction of Jesus, the sentencing to crucifixion, that he took his own life. We don't know a lot about the mind of Jesus, but what we do know a lot is about is the mind of Christ. We may not fully understand why Judas did what he did, although we can all relate to Jesus' plight in some way, can't we? That we've been betrayed or abandoned by those who were near and dear to us. Those who should have been there to help us hurt us. Have you been there? Why then, what, what was the mind of Christ in this? Why would he do this? Remember, Jesus' claims are that he's God in the flesh. Well, as God, he would determine where he's going to be born. What context? Interestingly, he chose the context of shame, being birthed out of an unwed pregnancy. Interesting. He didn't choose the path of popularity and posh living. He chose a path of obscurity and hardship and pain. Shame. Service to the public rather than being served. What was going through the mind of Christ that he would orchestrate from all eternity's beginning? He would orchestrate this divine plan that he would be betrayed in this manner and everything else that's about to unfold in the weeks to come. Why would he do this? It wasn't for him, friends. 
It wasn't because he needed to. It was because we needed him to. Ultimately, he knew what was going to happen. He foretold it in advance many, many, many times to others amongst his disciples and even in public. Is that me? Check, check, check. He foretold these events, friends, in advance, and he told why. He did it for us, right? Jesus, today I want you to understand, Jesus was a betrayed and abandoned for us. And in your outlines, I want you to notice Jesus was betrayed and abandoned so that we may experience his ransom and faithful relationship. Where he was sold off, Jesus pays the price to buy us. Where Jesus was abandoned in his relationships, he offers faithful relationship. Notice in verse the chapter 2, for there is one God and one mediator. It's back. God and mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. Why did Jesus do what he did? To ransom us. Friends, Jesus looked through the lens of eternity at every human being that would ever live on the face of the planet. Jesus looked through the lens of eternity and he saw you and he saw me and he saw every other person throughout history. He saw our brokenness. He saw our dirt. He saw our shame. He saw our pain, our twisted, perverted versions of who he made us to be. And he looked at us and he said, I want them. I love them and they are worth it. And he came and he paid the ultimate price. He ransomed us, and he offered to us, friends, faithful relationship. And notice in 1 Corinthians 6, it says, Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? God is in you. I want you to underline that. God, the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Friends, Jesus paid a price where he was sold off by his friend. Jesus willingly lays his life down as the ultimate price to buy us back. Jesus was sold off. We were bought. Bought at a price, and the price was nothing less than the very sacrifice, the very shed blood of God himself on your behalf, on my behalf, on all the world's behalf. And as king, in your outlines, spouse, father, sibling, and friend, those are all roles that Jesus said he fulfills in our life. He is our king. He is our ruler. He is also our spouse, the church. We, the people, are known as the church, and the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. He is the husband and we are the bride. That can be a little awkward for some of us, but have no fear. You'll understand the other metaphors that Jesus uses. King, husband, father. Yes, he is a father and he does love his children. Some of us will struggle with that one because we've seen the abuse of that position. But have no fear because he also refers to himself as a relationship like a sibling. We are brothers and sisters to Jesus. How amazing and incredible is that? And not only that, but we are friends of God. As friends of God, we have this relationship where we enjoy one another. And you know what the difference is between friend and the, all the other metaphors? 
that Scripture uses? Right? You ch- Notice that God uses each of these relationship examples to communicate his love and unwavering, unwavering faithfulness to us, his children, his people. And I've given you a list of scriptures there that I encourage you to go read because you need to know something. That where other people will abandon you, betray you, let you down, disappoint you, your heavenly father will not. For it is written in Hebrews 13, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. I want you to circle never both times. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And so we say with confidence, underline confidence. Do you know what the word confidence is? Faith. This is not some mysterious, ooey, weird, spiritual force, although it's a powerful force. Faith is confidence, trust. So we say with trust, we say with faith, we say with confidence that the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals Do to me. And this, friends, is what Jesus epitomizes. Not only was he betrayed and sold off, not only was he abandoned by those closest to him and left very much alone to face whatever he was about to face alone. Friends, here's the good news. No matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done, no matter how messed up, twisted, dark, and broken your life may be, he did this for you. He did this so that the promise of God may become a reality in your life, that he will become your ransom. He was sold so that you may be bought back. He was abandoned so that God could become your faithful king, father, sibling, and friend, and spouse, so that you will never be forsaken and never be alone, that God will be your helper. And as Jesus stood there before the crowd, knowing what was about to be happen, about to happen, knowing that he was going to be falsely accused, knowing that he was going to be convicted of crimes that he did not commit, King of kings, creator of the universe, was about to be sentenced and condemned to death as a criminal and tortured. So that we could have God as our helper. So that we could learn from this that Jesus epitomizes that God is with us and he will help us. And though Jesus went through the valley of the shadow of death and though he suffered terribly at the hands of these people. He came out the other side with victory. No matter how dark and how ugly it got, he knew his father was with him. Which you see that in the garden as he's praying. And he knew that on the other side of this pain, on the other side of this abandonment, on the other side of this unfairness, there were benefits. Not only would he achieve victory over sin, Satan, and death itself and be resurrected from the grave, but friends, he would make a way that all of us can walk in that same victory. We can reap the reward, reap the benefit. As he was treated unfairly, we benefit from it. And isn't that how it works in life? That a lot of times when we look at the unfairness in certain situations, we feel bad because we're paying a price that others are going to benefit from, right? And it does seem unfair, but that's part of free will, and it's part of what 
God created the world, how God created the world to function is that we gain when we stop focusing on ourselves. And we gain when we live interdependently and considerate of one another. And as we sacrifice, it's not always just for us. Many times it's not for us. It's so that others may benefit. This is how God thinks. He doesn't think with an inward selfish focus and motive. He considers others. It's an outward focus. So this morning, friends, I want to tell you life isn't fair. This morning, I want you to understand that there are prices to be paid, sacrifices to be made. And you will endure other kinds of pain and and we're going to talk about those on other kinds of unfairness. And we're going to talk about those in the weeks to come. But what I want you to grasp today is that in this unfairness, we benefit. Through Jesus' unfair treatment, we benefit. And what we benefit today, what I want you to leave here with, is that you've been ransomed. You've been bought with a price. And the privilege of that price being paid is that you and God become bound together if you so choose. And no matter how hard life gets, no matter how dark, no matter how challenging or painful, God is your helper. He never leaves you and he never forsakes you. And he will see you through to resurrection victory. No matter what the challenge, no matter what the difficulty, if we stay in that position that Jesus modeled, Father, I really don't want to go through this pain, but your will be done, not my will. Right? If we stay in that position where we hold tightly to the Lord, we will experience that faithfulness. And when we don't, here's what I want you to know. You may loosen your grip on the Lord, but he doesn't loosen his grip on you. We may be unfaithful at times, but God never is. He keeps his promise. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us. So if you're finding yourself neck deep or drowning in your problems, feeling alone, wondering where's God, remember this, he didn't move. You did. And all it takes, friends, isn't one step. All it takes is you turning around. That's what repentance is. Repentance, friends, is where you turn 180 degrees and you say, I'm not going to go this direction anymore. And you do an about face. You turn away from the wrong and you turn toward the right. You turn away from selfish living, turn away from sinful living, and you turn toward the Lord and right living. Not because you've earned it, not because you've deserved it, not because you can do it on your own. I'll tell you right now, you can't. Have you ever tried to be good? I suck at it. <laughs> Truly. If it were left up to Mike, there's a whole lot of selfishness that would come out. But as I do that about face and I give it to Jesus, he helps me. The Lord is my helper, and he never leaves me, and he never forsakes me. Maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel alone. Maybe you feel betrayed today. Maybe it's by others, some of those nearest and dearest to you. Some of you may be feeling betrayed by yourself. You've played the part of the fool, and you've ruined your life. Some feel abandoned and betrayed by God. Why did he make me this way? What, where is he in my pain? How come he let this happen or did this to me? Right? Friends, know this. Jesus is the epitome not only of unfairness, but the greatest demonstration of love and pursuit. He wants you. He proves to you that God cares. And that God promises that he's with you. All you got to do is turn around. Amen.
I would like you to close your eyes, and we're going to pray. And as we prepare to pray, I want to ask you, have you been doing life your own way? Have you played God in your life trying to be in charge and do what you want the way you want? I'm not asking, do you believe in God? I'm asking, who's in charge? And how's that working for you? Have you struggled with feeling alone and abandoned? Today I want to encourage you that God is reaching out to you. And some of you are sensing him tugging on your heart. Some of you are feeling God pulling you toward him and, and wrapping his arm around you and letting you know you're not alone. And whatever it is you're facing and going through, he's with you. And he is your helper that he paid that price. You've been bought back. You've been ransomed. Will you receive that gift of a relationship with God? Not religion, but a relationship where you grow in knowing God better and, and understanding who he is and how he works and how he wants to work in your life and bless you and help you. And will you care about him back so as to live in a way that is considerate and respectful and cooperative so that you can actually receive all that he has provided for you? Some of you, for the very first time, are sensing this God tugging on your heart. And if that's you, and you're feeling compelled to respond to him today, and you want to pray and, and make Jesus the Lord of your life, make Jesus your best friend, your uh, king, your father, your spouse, and so on, if, if that's you, then we're going to say a simple prayer for you to make that relationship agreement with Jesus. But some of us, friends, we, we believe in Jesus, we've prayed the prayer, but nonetheless, we feel abandoned by God. And I remind you, God doesn't move. We move. I remind you that he has promised to be faithful and to never leave you and to never forsake you. And so if you are struggling and you feel alone, you need to turn around. You need to turn around. Because God loves you and he is with you. And so this morning, you may sense God tugging on your heart that you need to recommit your life to him. And if that's you, I want to invite you to say a simple prayer of commitment along with those who would be doing this for the very first time. So with your focus on Jesus, this is why we close our eyes. We just simply don't want to be distracted. Normally, I encourage you to pray with your eyes open. But with your focus on Jesus, if it's in your heart to make a commitment or a recommitment to Christ, pray with the rest of our church family this simple prayer. Say, Father God, thank you for loving me, for wanting me, and pursuing me, and never leaving me or forsaking me. In the unfairness of life, I have both hurt and been benefited. But often, I have lived selfishly, despising my own sacrifice and glorying in my reward, pursuing my own wants and desires above everything and everyone. And I have hurt others. I have hurt myself. And I have hurt you. And I was wrong. Today I ask Jesus 
to become my king, my father, my friend, to take charge of my life, and to help me to grow in this relationship with God, to become who you made me to be, and to experience the fullness of this life that you've provided in this world and the next. Now help me, God, to live this out faithfully every day, remembering that I am never alone and that God is my helper at all times. In Jesus' name, amen.